The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. This is Mark Olson talking to you from Milwaukee. Uh, glad you could join us. The topic today is going to be balancing again. It seems to be no end in uh, interest in the marketplace with all things balancing, but it stands the reason, right? Because it's a um, heart of um, adequate or proper flow, whether we're talking hydronic or plumbing, and those will be the type of applications we talk about today. So the title is Selecting the Proper Balancing Valve for the Purpose at Hand. And today I'll be using a number of photographs and installations and schematics and even illustrations to try to convey, because a big part of being able to select the proper balancing valve is first knowing what kind of balancing valves are available and how do they perform taking a look at the inside of the balancing valve and how they perform within the system. So we'll be going through that. Thank you for all the folks that answered uh, questions as part of the registration process. And uh, design journals, uh, number 21 is out. This is our every six month journal. This one actually does involve balancing. Uh, it's talking about balancing in domestic hot water uh, systems as part of the overall topic of recirculation. Okay, so be on the lookout for, well, it's already out. So if you're on the mailing list and somehow you haven't gotten your copy, get a hold of us. Uh, sometimes we clean that list up and perhaps you got dropped off if you didn't respond back to us that you're still interested. Uh, those go out uh, from our uh, postage over to your desk free of charge. Okay, they're also available as PDF, which can very easily be sent to uh, colleagues, if you will. Okay. The aspect of balancing is really, a balancing valve is a form of a hydraulic resistor. Think of it that way. So if we have a pipe and some circulator in our system is driving flow through that pipe as indicated by the black arrow, uh, we can take that pipe, introduce some type of balancing device, and in doing so, we can take the flow rate down to the design value that that circuit's calling for. And while doing that, in addition to setting the flow rate for that particular circuit, in adjusting the flow rate, it makes more head available from the pump to be able to service the other circuits that are connected in parallel with this particular circuit. So it has a couple of functions when you do balancing. Now we'll be talking about a number of balancing valves today, manual balancing valves, you see the top two up there. We'll be talking about automatic balancing valves or sometimes called pressure independent constant flow balancing valves. And we'll be talking about some specialty valves in the marketplace that you can see this bottom three there as well. The last one we'll be finishing up this presentation on a unique type of balancing valve. There's only a couple of manufacturers in the North American marketplace with this at this time called thermal balancing valves and Kalefi being one of those two. So we step back and think, okay, what's the objective of balancing taking a hydronic application as an example? This is a heating application and we have flow going up into a coil, in this case, a heating coil. And this piece of equipment is going to specify a design flow rate by which they want that flow to uh, be at. Or perhaps a set of flow rates depending on entering water temperatures, for example. So balancing is used to make sure that we have design flow um, occurring properly in that type of uh, emitter, end emitter, end unit. And manufacturers are typically gonna, well, not typically, they're always gonna uh, have flow rates that are going to maximize heat transfer. And it's gonna be somewhat turbulent flow because there's a huge difference in the ability for water to convey heat through a pipe, whether it's laminar or tub turbulent, a big difference. It breaks up, turbulent flow breaks up the otherwise boundary layer that would exist in laminar flow, preventing efficient transfer of heat to the wall of the pipe. Or we might be cooling or dehumidifying by way of some uh, terminal unit. And uh, if we're if we're cool, if we're dehumidifying, for example, our chilled water is going to want to convey heat transfer through the pipe and into the coils to create a surface temperature that is down below the dew point that exists in the building at the time. And that dew point can change at times. And therefore, some systems will require a flow rate one moment at X and a different flow rate at Y. So another example of how we want to control flow by way of balancing in a uh, end unit. Now it's not terminal units that we do balancing. There are generators that require specific uh, flow rates. Take your average residential uh, boiler, for example, the manufacturer will specify a minimum flow rate by which he wants flow to continue through that boiler to A, uh, maximize heat efficiency, 
and B, to prevent any type of um, hotspots and uh, therefore some problems with thermal stresses that could occur from perhaps a vaporization that could take place in, in the system. And some manufacturers might even specify a maximum flow rate through their, in this case, boiler to, to perform or to prevent against the classic effects of excessive flow through any unit in a hydronic system, that being uh, erosion from excessive uh, uh, fluid velocity, for example, it could be noise, for example, and other ill effects. So hydronics has lots of applications for balancing. If, if you jump in, it's all associated with heat transfer. Now, if we go over to plumbing, for example, the biggest use of balancing devices in plumbing applications is by far hot water recirculation. And so if we have a riser and we have from our recirculation pump hot water going up through to each of our fixtures, our objective is not heat transfer, our objective is temperature. Because in the end, what we're trying to do is assure proper temperature, temperature of the water that when there's hot water called at each of those terminal devices, it quickly finds its way to that fixture and thereby not wasting water or resources was at, at heart the reason why we uh, recirculate water. So if we step back and we look at any circuit balance, just as a starting point here, let's get rid of that connected uh, piece. And we just look at uh, anything that the pump is gonna drive flow to. So starting with this, call it this a pressure gauge here, back to this pressure gauge here. And if we were to measure the resistance of this circuit to flow as a function of flow rate, thereby generating a flow curve, it would look something like this, probably familiar to almost all of you, all right? The head loss in feet ahead as a function of flow rate is, is exponential in relation, not linear, exponential, and I think everyone knows that too. So if we wanted in this circuit, this hypothetical circuit to attain a design flow rate of 3.8, we need to select a pump that will allow us to get 3.8 gallons per minute on this circuit. And so our closest pump might look something like this. Uh, this would result in what eyeballing it, maybe 4.3 gallons per minute. We want 3.8. So the purpose of a balancing valve is to add some restriction in there that allows that curve to begin shifting to the left so that its intersection will allow us to attain our desired flow rate of 3.8. Okay, now this is a simple circuit. It doesn't have any other connected uh, parallel circuits, but in some cases, and you'll see actually a photograph later on that it makes sense to put a little adjustment mechanism on even a uh, simple circuit uh, like this with a uh, fixed speed pump. Or the designer could instead put a variable speed pump and do away with the uh, balancing valve and dial that uh, variable speed pump down to the exact flow rate that he wants on that fix, fixed flow rate circuit. Okay. Now, now, as it relates to selecting a um, circulator, which is important as it relates to balancing, uh, designers will uh, de develop their own uh, system curve by way of some equation. Here's one typical equation that's associated with turbulent flow, which is what we're all about, right, in hydronics. And it's head loss is the function of some constant times the flow rate, in this case, we use the letter F, to the 1.75 power. And those constants are a uh, fluid properties constant, that's A, a pipe size coefficient, that's C, and L is the total equivalent length of pipe that this circuit represents, okay? And so um, designers will take each of these components and perhaps using a reference table, be able to transfer or translate the flow coefficient or the resistance of it in this case, this ball valve to an equivalent length of pipe. So it's the common denominator consistent with the pipe in the circuit. So in this case, we have 68 feet of pipe and we have four sections uh, of uh, elbows, each at worth two feet each and so on and so forth. And so the total equivalent length, 112.4 here. This is, this is L that would go into this equation and hard, uh, software is available out there that allows the designer to do this uh, more easily rather than by using an equation like this is built into the software. Now going around talking to our guys, talking to the folks out there, the designers, sometimes they'll take a rule of thumb instead of doing all these equivalent lengths of feet, they'll simply take what is available as the pipe in their circuit, in this case, 68 feet, and add some factor, perhaps it's 50% 
accounting for all the other type of components that could be on the system. And that would, in this case, be 102 feet. It would, it would be a little bit less than actual here. Now, this is a hypothetical example. And that 50% is a common uh, factor that's used just to be conserved and make sure your pump is large enough to cover the flow rate required in that circuit. So uh, we find that uh, commonly as we go around the North American marketplace. So we've been talking about static balancing valves up until now. Here's a photograph of a, <laughs> a static balancing valve over there. This contractor just pressed it in. Now you can probably guess this installation is not in Missouri. Bob, would you say that's safe to say? I would say. <laughs> yeah, this is in uh, coastal Southern California where you might expect a rooftop unit like this to exist. So if we um, go back to balancing again here now and add another circuit, we're not going to want to have a balancing valve here. It would not make sense. We would put the balancing valve in each of the crossover circuits here so that this fixed speed pump can deliver its design flow rate after the contractor has adjusted each of the balancing valves. Okay, now hydronics allows us to do what? What's, a, what's an important feature of hydronics versus uh, as far as easily attainable versus other forms of heat distribution? Well, it's zoning. And so a lot of times we'll have zoned circuits here, all right, whether it's cooling or heating. Now we have a potential problem if we have a fixed speed pump here. Why? We have a differential pressure control problem in the event that uh, these zone valves close off, any remaining open circuits connected, we only showed two here, but it could be 10, uh, we'll see, receive the flow that this pump that doesn't sense one turning off is going to want to deliver. And as these close off, the remaining open ones will do what? <clears throat> they'll, they'll experience flow rates that could be, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the earlier grape I ate, um, higher than uh, is, is, is acceptable, not just from a pipe velocity standpoint, but your differential pressures could, in this case, build up to the point where they would exceed the zone valve's close-off pressure, just for example. So we need to <clears throat> have the um, differential pressure controlled somehow. Uh, before we go to an example, here's a good example of that type of um, system. Uh, this is a balancing valve, in this case, a variable orifice balancing valve, a control valve, in this case, an on-off zone valve, and the circulator isn't shown in the photo shot here. So one form of differential pressure control is using a differential pressure bypass valve. How this works, let's take a look at what these things look at, like on the inside. It's a very simple device. It's a disc that's held down on a seat by way of a compression spring whose tension is adjustable by a setting knob. That's this guy here. And so what happens is if this is your design condition where you're sending flow to each of your open circuits over here under design conditions, when this zone valve closes off, the flow rate going through that circuit now gets diverted to the bypass loop. That in essence is how these differential pressure bypass valves work. Now, a rule of thumb, oftentimes designers will say, well, if I have two or three zones, I really don't worry about it when I have a fixed speed pump and, uh, 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 circuits that look like this, but when I get into three, uh, four, five, six, now it becomes more important to have some other form of differential pressure control other than, say, the pump, okay? Even the pump itself, even a fixed speed pump, if it has a flat curve, does perform some level of differential pressure uh, control so that in the end, you have proper flow, design flow through your remaining open circuits. They've been around a long time. We still sell a lot of them. Our, our, our guys that are other brands out in the marketplace still sell a lot of them because people know they work. And um, here's an example of such uh, taken uh, in the Chicago area a few years back. Now, can we introduce a electronically commutated motor pump here to marry up with these valves? Uh, yes. In fact, we could put that in constant speed mode to kind of emulate a permanent split capacitor uh, pump. This happens all the time as older single speed pumps wear out, the contractor has the choice to put a much more efficient pump in by way of an ECM pump. And by putting it in constant speed mode, it would emulate basically the pump it replaced, including the performance of the differential pressure bypass valve or the use of the differential pressure bypass valve. And he would gain the electrical uh, efficiencies that ECM pumps deliver versus uh, permanent split capacitor pumps. But it wouldn't make sense necessarily to do this. Uh, you'd probably want to take advantage of the smart features of the pump and instead put the pump in some type of uh, varying mode, like constant differential pressure uh, mode. Uh, 
in which case you can do away with the differential pressure bypass valve because this now is going to sense when this valve closes off, the pump in this mode will sense an attempt for the differential pressure across the pump to begin increasing and it senses that and it starts to slow the pump down, maintaining differential pressure across his headers so that the circuit balanced by this balance valve is going to continue getting its uh, design flow rate. Now, if we have a large run of, I like that, large, a large run of piping from our pump up to our terminal units, let's say we have in the east wing is our pump, in the west wing auditorium is where we have our termination units here, we might have a really long uh, run of a pipe, and that could represent significantly head, higher head loss in comparison to any of the crossover circuits that it is driving. In that case, the contractor may elect to uh, put the pump in proportional differential pressure mode. Works very similar to constant differential pressure mode, but it takes into consideration that added resistance that is um, uh, represented by long runs or narrow pipes. <clears throat> okay, let's continue on with automatic balancing valves. We just left manual balancing valves. And by the way, we're going to look at the inside of some of these manual, these manual balancing valves because they're very common. Um, and what's an automatic balancing valve? Well, it can come in the form to you as a compact automatic balancing valve. Uh, there's three players in the marketplace that I know of in addition uh, outside of, well, one, two outside of Kalefi that I can think of. So they're out there. Or a more traditional form of automatic balancing valve that you might be familiar with. And that on the inside would look something like this. Flow comes in left to right and some type of cartridge has moving parts in there, basically a piston held uh, uh, compressing against the spring with the characterized opening here. And that design allows us now to maintain flow through a circuit by way of this balancing valve, regardless of what happens to all the other zone valves on our system here. So this could close off. And if we had three gallons per minute here and three gallons per minute, and this closes off, even with the fixed speed pump, this valve is going to sense it, that piston is going to push in, keeping less flow available for flow in the end, maintaining its design flow rate. So they're, they maintain flow rate. They're not highly efficient in terms of uh, other options, they are parasitic from that standpoint, but they do accomplish the task of uh, maintaining the design flow rate intended for that circuit. Automatic balancing valves. So oh, there's, my, there's my example of um, turning off that zone valve. Okay, now could I use automatic balancing valves instead with the ECM pump in tandem? Uh, well, yes, you can. Okay, as this valve closes off, all right, um, you're not going to have flow through here, um, and your pump is going to start backing down. Your your automatic balancing valve probably won't change its position. That internal um, cartridge won't change its position. But by specifying this type of balancing valve in this circuit, even with the ECM pump, it better assures uh, the flow rate intended for that circuit to be accomplished versus using traditional forms of manual balancing valves. Otherwise, it works the same as a manual balancing valve in this application with the ECM pump. Okay. Now, these balancing valves require a minimum differential pressure across them to maintain their constant flow. So you want to make sure that your ECM pump has uh, is producing enough differential pressure across here to keep it in that in that range, the operating range that the manufacturer has stated for that type of balancing valve. Okay, so these automatic types that I just described, how do they work? On the inside, I mentioned there's a piston and spring mechanism, and um, it looks like this, uh, non-compressed and compressed. And uh, the operating curve associated with this is that in the valve. Uh, we have differential pressure. This is the, the pressure drop across the valve as a function of flow rate, okay? So if we started at zero and began flowing through the valve, the flow rate would increase until the point where the differential pressure, the pressure drop that is, reaches the rate of flow of the pressure independent of the valve, all right? That might be a, a half gallon per minute. It could be 20 gallons per minute. That's Kalefi's range. Other manufacturers will have different ranges. Any differential pressure that the valve experiences higher than that, the valve will adjust and maintain its flow rate at that uh, stated flow. In this case, this cartridge indicates 
10 gallons per minute. So this is the desirable working range of differential pressure across the valve the valve is intended to work under, okay? And for those that like to think in terms of water column, this minimum differential pressure needed for, to be generated by that pump uh, is uh, 4.6 feet of uh, head or water column, okay? All right, we're moving along here. Field adjustable automatic balancing valves. Well, this isn't field adjustable. Going back up here, let's go. Oh, oh, oh. This is an automatic balancing valve. So what is a field adjustable balancing valve? All right. Well, sometimes these, these valves are not adjustable in the field. In order, way, in order to adjust the valve, the uh, cap would have to be pulled off, the cartridge pulled out, and the contractor would have to find another cartridge to put back in here. So if you wanted five gallons per minute and you only had three, the cartridge would have to get pulled out. So they're not adjustable per se in the field very easily. Now there are field adjustable automatic balancing valves available. They would look something like this. Now this looks pretty gargantuan, it's a little bit out of scale, but I wanted to show that they have a, a, a scale here where the contractor can adjust an automatic balancing valve um, to the desired constant flow that he desires on this circuit over here. Now, uh, full disclosure, Kalefi in North America does, does not have these, but thinking offhand as an example, who does? Our friends down the road at, in Morton Grove, Exylum, for example, would be a provider to the marketplace of this type of valve. Okay, a little bit more expensive, but in some cases, a good solution. Okay, so back to this circuit then, all right. If we wanted to modulate flow in this circuit using this type of valve and instead you know, an on-off zone valve here put a pressure independent control valve that could be modulated open and close or anywhere in between um, if we if we decided to try to reduce the flow by modulating that valve close with this type of valve or even the non-adjustable automatic bouncing valve they would it would fight it the differential pressure would change here it would sense here and want to send more flow so they would not work together Instead of an automatic balancing valve with a modulating valve here, uh, you would put a static balancing valve. Now, a static balancing valve does not give you uh, pressure independence, uh, meaning the flow uh, is susceptible to differential pressures changes on this circuit when other zone valves and, and pumps turn on and off in the system. Okay, but a modulating zone valve in the, in the end sometimes accounts for that. To give quicker response though in that regard is something called the pressure independent control valve. This combines the function of an automatic balancing valve and a modulating zone valve or a control valve, if you will, all wrapped up into one package. There's probably, I don't know, three, four manufacturers at a minimum in the North American marketplace that offer this. Cleffy does not offer this in the marketplace. Uh, so there are oftentimes uh, associated with building automation systems. Uh, they receive an input of either zero to 10 or two to 10 uh, signals or four to 20 milliamp. And so where would they be used? Well, assume that these are uh, chiller coils, all right? Or dehumidification coils, let's say. And uh, some type of humidistat in the room that we're looking to condition is saying, uh, I'm getting too humid here for my occupants. I need to uh, fire on my coil to start getting some dehumidification. And uh, the um, building automation system says, uh, I want three gallons per minute. So this would adjust to three gallons per minute. And then the next refresh on a reading from the building automation system says, um, I'm not quite doing it. Uh, I need to increase that to a higher flow rate to cool that coil down even further to get more dehumidification. So it sends this up to four gallons per minute. And so you get that modulating back and forth from inputs coming from the building automation system. And pressure independent control valves are ideally used with variable speed pumps, whether a VFD or an ECM, because you're in the end trying to eke out every little bit of energy uh, uh, in that building. And these often are associated with very large buildings that can consume a lot of energy using other forms of balancing. So, uh, so we ran through some of the balancing valves. We'll get into some more, but just step back and say, well, how do you set the flow rate on these traditional manual balancing valves? And here's one on another rooftop unit. And that might even be the same rooftop. Uh, that looking at the handle, that looks like that might be a Victaulic, for example, balancing valve. Um, and so it, this is the Kalefi version of that. We can see that the knob has been set for 3.6. And so um, what we want to do is set uh, a manometer across these pressure ports here 
when we have flow going through so that we can set the flow rate. And the inside of a balancing valve like this called a fixed orifice balancing valve, it's called fixed because the orifice between the ports that you're gonna take a pressure differential measurement does not change as the handle my lowers and raises the globe on the valve itself. So it's independent of anything going on with the knob. And there's a direct one-for-one -one relationship between pressure drop here and the amount of flow rate going through here. And manufacturers publish those tables that make it easy for uh, contractors to set the flow rate. So here's one that was taken from, uh, this is a Belco balancing here in Milwaukee, who was on a job site with us. We can see a classic uh, balancing valve. This is a Cleffy balancing valve. He's about ready to set the flow rate. We can see an on off his own valve over here in the circuit. Okay, so it's a three quarter inch valve. And let's say our task was that we wanted to attain 3.5 gallons per minute in this three quarter inch line. Okay, question is what differential pressure does this valve have to create <clears throat> on our manometer that would equate the 3.5 gallons per minute? Well, we would go to the manufacturer's chart that has a number of curves associated with each size. In this case, we have half inch <clears throat> valve, three quarter inch up to two inch. And what was our, our goal was 3.5 gallons per minute, right? So we go along the X axis, which is our flow rate. We interpolate where 3.5 gallons per minute is. We take that up to the three quarter inch curve, okay? And where that intersects, we go across here. And now this gives us our differential pressure, in this case, 0.3 PSI, that that manometer uh, is to um, read as you adjust this valve. And when you get 0.3 um, PSI, now you know you have 3.5 gallons per minute going through your valve there. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use. Now, if you didn't have a graph, that's okay. As long as you knew the, the uh, CV of that uh, Venturi between the pressure ports, in this case, it's 6.4, uh, simple equation that most hydronic uh, designers would know. Delta P uh, equals, um, in English units anyway, uh, flow rate, in this case, we're using Q, divided by the flow co coefficient squared. And so we can plug in our values of our target flow rate and our CV taken here. And if you do the math, that equals 0.3 PSI, the same as we found on our tables. Okay, different ways of skinning the cat. Now, how do you adjust flow and set the flow rate on a circuit that is being um, controlled by a variable orifice balancing valve? A little bit more involved, but certainly manageable. They're very popular in the marketplace, but certainly by way uh, uh, they're, uh, well, they're less expensive than other balancing valves generally. And so they're variable in that the pressure ports are in between our pressure taps. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> the, um, in this case, a modified globe here, our adjustment mechanism as we turn the valve and uh, vary the flow is in between our PT, our uh, uh, pressure ports, I'm getting tongue tied here. And therefore, we introduce another variable into the factor and it's a changing flow coefficient uh, associated with uh, the valve setting. So uh, they're very popular, as I mentioned, here's some photographs of such type of valves being uh, balanced. So uh, going back to example again, using this type of valve, variable orifice, let's say again, we have three quarter inch. Now, every size valve will have uh, a separate table, why? because every knob setting, as indicated here, represents a different flow coefficient. So let's say, for example, in this case, we want to set the flow rate through our variable orifice balancing valve to five gallons per minute, okay? And we set, well, flow goes through the circuit, we set the valve to knob two, which corresponds to this curve over here, two, and we do a differential pressure reading and our manometer says you're, ge you're generating three PSI. Well, we can go across and see that that is equate, equates to three gallons per minute. Okay, too low. Now the contractor might say, and then the experienced contractors are pretty adept at that. They might say, okay, we need to open up this valve to something higher. They might choose setting four. They do setting four, they take a reading, perhaps it's two PSI, they drop down and they see they only, they have six gallon per minute, so they overshot. And so you can see there's an iterative effect that these balancing valves go through in order to set the flow rate. Other manufacturers such as Xylem try to make that much easier by way of a calibration wheel that basically takes this information and puts it in circular form for ease of use, okay? 
variable orifice balancing valves. Now we're going to continue on to another balancing valve that's also fixed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, manual. But this is an interesting photograph and it's, it, it explains and illustrates balancing valves generally don't like debris. Not an issue in plumbing applications per se, but in hydronics, debris, a big form of debris could be uh, the eventual buildup of corrosion in the system. And you don't want that getting into any of your uh, components, much less a balancing valves. So in this particular case submitted, this is a job from Robert Bean's company up in Canada. Uh, coming off of the a boiler header is a flow going down through, in this case, this is a Y strainer. So it's protecting the zone valve and back up the balancing valve that flow is traveling through. Okay, those Y strainers look <clears throat> something like this. And when they're dirty, they look something like, like this. And hopefully they get cleaned out by uh, the contractor and put back into service. Another form of keeping debris from causing problems in the system is some form of dirt separator, a uh, number of manufacturers out there, uh, or a magnetic dirt separator, as you see here from, from Kalefi. They do a really good job scrubbing that system of any debris that potentially otherwise would get uh, into perhaps a, a balancing valve. <clears throat> Remember, automatic balancing valves uh, have moving parts, so you want to keep them clean, right? I showed you the spring piston uh, or a diaphragm. Uh, and static balancing valves that require uh, pressure ports, uh, the, the signal can be interfered with, with uh, uh, from dirt getting um, uh, dirt effects across those ports. We'll come to that in just a second. In fact, we'll come to it right here. So when you set flow rate using a manometer on a balancing valve, the sources of flow air are, well, firstly, manometer calibration. Uh, the manometer itself, uh, in many cases, needs to be zeroed, but the, the manometer and the connected hoses need to be rid of any air. Air is compressible, so if you have air in one hose and not the other, you can get a false reading high or a false reading low. So it's important to make sure air is bled out out of manometer uh, or out of the hoses in the manometer. Manometer gauge reading interpretation, okay? Whether it's an analog gauge or a digital gauge, uh, the dial could be moving uh, because of turbulence. I think of this, uh, I, I'm a fisherman and I do, uh, I, I bass fish and if I get a good fish, uh, this is kind of to illustrate the point, I bring it in. Even a digital gauge can have problems. You bring your fish in, before you put release them back, uh, you put a uh, put them on a digital gauge, and uh, at one moment it says it's 4.2 pounds. Hey Joe, I got a 4.2. Wait a second, it's 3.4 pounds. No, 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 it's now 4.8. Well, as that fish is moving, it causes that load cell to to vary, and so you can't get an accurate reading. Now that's an exaggeration of what you might see in a manometer, but it explains that that they do vary, and therefore there, it has is subject to error trying to figure out what the reading really is. Uh, flow interpolation, as we showed, these are log charts, so they require some interpolation. Even dials uh, require interpolations, like um, like the Xylem dialo and other uh, tools that manufacturers offer to the marketplace have interpolation needed. And even the interpolation of where the knob is, uh, where is 3.75 on this? The contractor has to make the judgment. In the case of Kalefi, it's a pretty clear indicator, but in other um, valves, it might be a, a little bit more difficult. So getting back to this photograph uh, taken from a great uh, looking job that uh, Robert Bean's company did a while back. Uh, this, is a, this is a balancing valve here, it's a static balancing valve. And if you haven't seen it until, until now, I'll just spend one second on here or one minute. Here's the balancing valve and how the contractor sets the flow rate on this valve, flow goes up through here. It's a fixed orifice valve. You can see the Venturi here. And we have over here a bypass loop. This bypass loop is used only for setting the flow rate or at a later date, verifying the flow rate is still what you had, okay? So when the contractor goes to set the flow rate, flow's going through the valve, pulls the pin, it lifts this washer off its seat, inducing flow up through this, this vertical chamber here. Inside this chamber is a disc that's magnetized against the spring. And that magnetized disc attracts this metal ball that's on the outside of the valve, so it's dry. And that, fell, that ball will rise up and the reading will tell you the flow rate going through the valve. Within seconds, uh, the contractor can set the flow rate and negating a lot of the otherwise issues associated with other types of manual balancing valves. And because of this, they're very popular. Uh, here's a really nice unit down in uh, North Carolina submitted by Harvey Euchre. Uh, it's a combination heat cool system. 
He's got a heat pump in here as well, a geothermal heat pump as well as a condensing uh, boiler on that system. Uh, here's one out in Montana, a geothermal system. This is in a ground vault and each of our uh, ground loops now is coming into a header and we're balancing them to the two or three gallons per minute that uh, is called for in each of those loops. Uh, here's another one uh, up in Colorado from Mitch Stanfield. A nice job that's not buttoned up yet. We get a lot of photographs, by the way, that uh, we like to use that doesn't have insulation because it shows a lot more. And But when you put insulation on, it hides a lot of things. So this job looks like this, uh, all buttoned up nicely up in Mountain Village, Colorado. So you can see the quick setting balancing valves here. Uh, driven by, by the way, a variable speed pump over here. Great marriage, uh, a smart pump static balancing valves, a uh, reason for why I believe static balancing valves at a minimum are holding their own amongst all those balancing valve choices out in the marketplace, if not e even increasing. Now the quick center uh, valve from Calepi is available now, available now in flanged um, units. So you got bigger pipe sizes, more commercial. Uh, everything works the same. You can see the same uh, flow meter here. Now we added a little feature that's convenient and we have a little isolation valves over here. In the event that you're, um, uh, meter get some debris in it rather than isolate uh, the system you can simply isolate this uh, pull this off clean it out and put it back in the surface very conveniently and here are four of those such valves that are used on the secondary of this system <clears throat> okay how are we doing for time okay we're doing pretty good uh, here's an example of uh, a few years ago that we could have used such a, a valve in okay we're going to go to glycol and in about in 10 minutes, I'll talk about plumbing, and then we'll have time for some questions. And uh, again, if I didn't mention it, people that want to hang on after the presentation that have, have specific questions, uh, Bob and myself, and maybe even Kevin will hang around and try to answer the questions for, say, another half an hour. Okay, glycol, very commonly used here in North America, not so much in, in Europe, by the way. And uh, what so the question is, how do you compensate the balancing valve readings um, to uh, adjust for the different properties that glycol or any antifreeze has? Well, let's take glycol, which is the most common. It's denser than water. It has a different viscosity than water at almost all temperatures, except for very high temperatures. And it has different surface tension. And there's other properties that are different. And those properties change with temperature. So there's potentially a slight derating when using water tables to set flow rate when you have glycol. I say potentially because you can see generally not. How so? Well, let's start off with our manual balancing valves. These require simply a DP reading across these ports, right? Our 130 and 142 valves, as we showed examples of. Of all these uh, variables up here, the only one that is of, uh, comes to bear uh, as an as a influencing factor is specific gravity, okay? And so you want to derate, derate your pressure differential reading by the reciprocal of the specific gravity of the fluid, of the, of the glycol mix, all right? So let's use an example. Um, before we do that, um, what is this specific gravity of glycol? Well, here's from Dow's Answer Center. Uh, this is uh, temperature and this is, well, I'll call it uh, specific gravity, okay? Um, with one being our water reference. Uh, let's use an extreme measure. 50-50 is pretty much as about as thick as you're going to get as far as glycol. And if we use 50-50 uh, um, glycol, we can see at, uh, say, 60 degrees temperature that has a uh, specific gravity of 1.04. By the way, it doesn't change a lot. As it gets cooler, it goes up to 1.06. As it heats up, it actually crosses down below 1, uh, for example. That's the property of glycol. So it doesn't really vary too much as opposed to, say, viscosity. So with this in mind, this 1.04 that I just pointed out, we can take our equation I just talked about and we can apply it. So if our water tables are used to try to set the flow rate with a system that has glycol, and let's say for argument's sake that we um, measured 0.3 PSI across our on our manometer. If we were using water, that would equate to 3.5 gallons per minute. But what would it read if it were Re, uh, truly be if it was glycol. Well, 50-50 has a 1.04 specific gravity, and we can take this 0.3 and make an adjustment to the tune of the reciprocal, or one over the specific gravity, so to speak, and it's 0.29. It doesn't change it by very much, and so you can see the effect is very uh, small relative to any corrections, and in our mind, not significant to worry about. Just use the water tables is our advice on this type of valve. 
other valves, automatic balancing valves, have moving parts in them, unlike those static balancing valves that we just talked about. And so viscosity is potentially a factor. And we can look at Dow's answer center here and we can see viscosity as a function of temperature again. If we pick out 60 degrees, we can see water has a viscosity of one, um, I've been out of school for too long, sent to poises. <laughs> and 50-50 uh, glycol north of that by a substantial measure, measure, in this case, 10, okay? And so what happens with automatic balancing valves that have moving parts is not only do you have specific, specific gravity as an issue, you also have viscosity, but they tend to counter affect one another because why? Viscosity is a measure of the resistance of uh, a fluid to flow. And as a result, even though we have differential pressure um, biasing a reading in one direction, we have vis viscosity working in the other direction. And as a result, through all of our testing, it's insignificant derating at typical operating temperatures that you're gonna find in hydronic systems. Same holds true for quick setting balancing valves. We have a moving part that is a disc and insignif insignificant derating at typical operating temperatures, which really simplifies uh, the job of having to worry about adjustments on uh, the, our balancing valves. Okay. Hot water recirculation, I'm gonna take a deep breath and um, and uh, get into this, all right? And we'll answer questions towards, towards the end. Balancing and hot water recirculation. Here's an example of a system schematic. We have a hot water source, hot water heating source, and we have risers, in this case, three. These may be going up, or say if you're in a nursing home, they might be going out one wing and out another wing, servicing a bunch of fixtures. And we, and when, if we were to not have a balance, if the contractor or a designer is want entire, um, desiring a half gallon per minute to go through each of his risers in recirculation, and he didn't have balancing valves fired on his circulation pump, he might get something like this. Well, uh, water is always going to favor the path of least resistance or any fluid for that matter, right? And so he might have too high a flow here and even starving flow out away from the pump. And as we get around talking to plumbing engineers around the country, this is an issue, uh, is making sure that the farthest fixtures get adequate flow of. So what we wanna do is like in hydronic applications, we wanna instill balancing valves in our riser. In this case, we typically wanna do it on the return riser coming back to the recirculation pump, okay? That allows us to balance to, in this case, a half gallon per minute in each of our risers. Now we use that half gallon per minute here as an example, not just as a coincidence, but it's a very common specification for plumbing engineers to specify. A couple of reasons for, for that, but one of them is that trying to reliably control flow to some value less than a half gallon per minute, given the manometers and devices that are used out there is sometimes very difficult. So by putting a 0.5 in there, whereas you might wanna have 0.1, based on his heat loss calculations, it assures that he's gonna get flow uh, to his um, risers, okay? <clears throat> um, and here's a photograph of that valve, if you haven't seen it. So in that application, hot water would be coming down on the return riser through the valve. It looks like it's upside down and it is, but these type of valves don't care what orientation they are. And so the contractor is pulling the pin uh, he reads one gallon per minute and he would adjust the mechanism here to dial in his half gallon per minute and he's done and has a, has a temperature gauge op option here uh, to monitor that the return temperature back to the recirculation pump is where he wants it at. If, he, if it isn't, he can make an adjustment. Uh, they have a check valve, a removable uh, bypass, as I mentioned here, and they come with union connections, this lead-free quicksilver balancing valve used in hot water recirc applications. Here's a shot in Michigan uh, that is not yet buttoned up yet, but uh, you can tell by different uh, wall valves open and closed there. But uh, Coleman Mechanical sent that in to us on Calefi Excellence. Now, before we leave this valve, um, this quick setter lead-free balancing valve, it doesn't stop this type of valve because of its features being used in hydronic applications. Myself and Kevin Freet visited a job right here uh, in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, and a, uh, a customer of, a, uh, of one of our customers, our steel. And this is uh, looking up into the ceiling and it's a four pipe fan coil, all right? So this is your cooling uh, coil. 
uh, with the flow rate adjusted. Maybe the flow rate here is going to be design flow rate. So one gallon cooling coil maybe two gallons per minute. And this one on the heating side might be one or something like that. Um, uh, so uh, another design practice uh, illustration here is a Y strainer to protect the balancing valve. A nice shot of that from this uh, contractor. Okay. Now we talked about mechanical balancing valves in hot water recirculation, okay? And we showed only one. You know, Cleffy has several. We have three other options that could be used that are all, are all mechanical, uh, either static or dynamic. Um, but this new notion of thermal balancing valves, and if you haven't learned about this, uh, I'll try to cover this real quickly. Instead of a mechanical balancing valve, we can, uh, we can put a thermal balancing valve in here. It doesn't respond to changing a pressure, it responds to temperature, much like a thermostatic mixing valve does. And so if we just did a close up on this middle section here on our system, uh, it would be this. This is the thermal balancing valve and here's a photograph of it. This is the uh, contractor adjusting the temperature to the target value that he wants at this valve. Uh, an optional temperature gauge to, to monitor his temperature and a check valve. By the way, check valves are very important to put on balancing valves in hot water recirculation systems in bigger systems uh, to prevent uh, um, uh, flows, uh, backflows causing a cooling down of our recirculation line. Uh, a lot of pressure dynamics can happen. And even if the recirculation pump has a check valve on it, you could have a problem in, uh, in application. So we always advise putting a check valve, whether sourced by Kalepi or your own check valve, like a swing valve or something like that, um, to use in this application. What do these look like? We have three configurations. This is probably going to be the most popular one. We began shipping these this year. Uh, we got another job going out here shortly. Um, and, um, and, and so this is the, the most popular configuration probably because it, it, it's a configuration that's not used it's used when uh, thermal disinfection isn't needed. So the inside, it looks like this. We have a thermostatic actuator that modulates up and down. As, as water comes in, the hotter the water, the more open this valve becomes. As, as the water cools down, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. <laughs> as the water is, the cooler the water this is, uh, the actuator opens up, the hotter the water is, it, it shuts down. And doesn't shut down completely, it shuts down to a value that is kind of a watchdog, watchdog flow rate, allowing some flow past this actuator so it can do the sensing of the, of the, of the water in the recirculation line, okay? Uh, that's this configuration. And if you look at the performance characteristics of this valve in application, it looks like this. Across the x-axis here, we have water temperature, Okay, in Fahrenheit. And in the y axis here, we have a measure of how open the valve is by measure of its CV value from zero to 2.5 is this graph. So you can see that at cool temperatures, the valve is wide open with a CV of 2.1. So it's, a, it's almost as if the valve's not there, right? And then as water temperature increases through this valve, the valve starts to close down. And you can see the CV decreasing here until it gets to the point where the um, this, this, this set uh, temperature that has been uh, adjusted to on the knob here, you can see 120 degrees here. In this case, we have 140. The set temperature is reached. If the water temperature were to continue to go past 140, it would just ride along the curve right here. If the water temperature was attempting to try to go under 140, it would cause the valve to begin opening up and causing more flow to go through the circuit that the valve is in, causing it to, so basically you're modulating, typically in most applications, you're modulating in this, in this area right here, okay? The second of three of the configurations is thermal sterilization configuration. It has an additional thermostatic actuator placed downstream from our main actuator. And the purpose of this is that it allows uh, thermal disinfection of your, of your risers without having to manually uh, bypass any, any valving. How does it do that? As the temperature increases, this one's com almost completely shut, right? This will sense a, a high temperature as this temperature narrows, uh, uh, approaches 160. This opens up, creating a bypass. So basically allowing a flushing of that riser 
for sterilization purposes. And the performance graph of this valve looks like this. The same here, but as I mentioned, as this temperature continues to increase, once it starts to approach uh, 106 degrees, it starts to open up, opening up the valve to a CV of 1.2, allowing a flushing. And this valve too automatically closes down as temperature continues on past the thermal distance, uh, past 170 degrees, allowing more flow to go to other parallel risers on your system. And then lastly, and we got six minutes here to go, is uh, thermal sterilization. This is uh, on demand. So instead of a thermally actuated valve, it's a, uh, a zone valve, if you will, that can be invoked so that on demand, uh, a riser could have flow go through it. Whether you're um, wanting to do sterilization from a chemical dosing standpoint or sterilization from a um, thermal disinfection standpoint. And the flexibility, uh, for example, could be you have a hotel has six wings and you might want to do sterilization of the sixth wing uh, with no inhabitants uh, one day, the fifth wing another day. So it gives a lot of bil ability for an automation system to do very uh, unique things uh, in their, in their uh, building. And its characteristic is as soon as you uh, actuate the valve, it opens up. So it's a step function here until you uh, uh, take a power 24 volt away from the actuator. Okay, so I think this is my last slide, and this is an example of how you would apply this thermal setting balancing valve. Full disclosure, you're hearing this from Kalefi, right, this type of balancing valve, but we're not the first ones in the North American marketplace. I'll tip my hat off to another um, make out there. If you haven't heard, it's a thermal Omega Tech. So there's at least two players in the marketplace uh, for um, this type of valve. So moving on, example using thermal setter, okay. Um, could be something like this. You set your aquastat to 130 degrees and then set your thermal setting balancing valves, dial them down to 120 degrees, okay? What happens is, uh, let's say that we haven't turned our pump on yet. Everything's cool in our system, which means that our valves are sitting here fully open. Pump turns on, sends hot water, because these valves are fully open, it's as if it's not even balanced. And so what's going to happen? Well, water is going to favor the path of least resistant. So this riser is going to get a disproportionate greater amount of flow. And this valve is quickly going to close off until it reaches its set pressure or temperature of 120. This one does the same. It closes off next, closes off right on down the line until all of them are closed down. And then it becomes, uh, then, then this circulator basically is in watchdog mode and these valves as well. The, exam the advantages of this type of approach, each circuit self balances, avoids commissioning labor. The valves themselves modulate with, with changes in supply temperature. So it always chases the proper temperature at the fixture. So it opens and closes in response to perhaps a drawdown on the uh, hot water heater. It'll want to open up, for example. And uh, especially when using an ECM pump, it provides the opportunity for some significant electrical costs uh, for uh, operating the pump. And if you're going to do thermal disinfection, uh, our two bypass models allow you to avoid having to bypass the balancing valves themselves. Um, thank you very much on behalf of uh, Kalefi and myself and Bob.